This is actually a, another really interesting conversation. What the memory hierarchy of a GPU is. I am an engineering lead and manager for a project called um, AI Foundation Models and Endpoints at NVIDIA. A recent release was Dplot, which is a model that can actually strip the values out of charts, right? It, it can take a chart mm. and say like, oh, what are the nu numeric values associated with this chart? And, and it can do that, right? It's really cool to see what people have built and what people do with um, what we provided. How should someone actually get started on their GNN journey? I, I, I often find that GNNs uh, are a very nuanced topic. I don't see mm -hmm. a ton of folks who maybe go after it. And so any advice there? A large portion of it is actually just figuring out how to represent your problem. It's, it's hard to get started, right? There's, there's like an inertia there that's like, this is something that's hard to do. And... Welcome to episode 11 of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today, we have Kyle Crannon. He's currently a team lead slash manager in the Deep Learning Algorithms Group at NVIDIA, leading the development and release of AI Foundation model endpoints. Kyle is an absolute beast in deep learning and graph neural networks. Kyle, stoked to have you on the show. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for reaching out. It's, a, you know, I've loved chatting with you, you know, off the air, and I'm, I'm glad to have a really fun conversation on the air. Perfect. Uh, so you're currently leading a team deploying, I would say, the latest and greatest, um, both enterprise and open source language models. What yep. would you say is the process of optimizing a large language model for deployment? So there, there, there are a couple of optimizations, right? Um, when you start with the model, usually it's it's in some form of a, a framework that it's trained in, which implies that you know you've you, you've the model has been optimized for training. Um, if you're talking about you know, Nvidia libraries, for example, you can you can train a model in a, a library called Megatron, which is made for um, basically like large scale training and uh, 3D parallelism, which is basically a way to train models effectively parallel across many GPUs. And uh, when you receive it in that format, you'll, you'll receive it as like a PyTorch tensor, right? And if you were to, you know, put it in and, and just do the forward of that model, that's likely going to be very efficient because there are actually a number of optimizations that can happen at, you know, compile time for inference models. So the first step there is you really want to get it into a representative format and uh, sort of a, um, a format in which the model is actually optimized for inference. Um, and for that, you might use a library that uh, compiles the, or takes the model and compiles it down into a bunch of um, atomic operations or even some fused operations, and then represents that in, in, in as purely a forward graph. Like there's no backward pass. You're, you're not doing any math that is, that is used for the backward pass. You're only, only doing math that's used for the forward pass. And that might be doing something like using a framework like TensorRT from NVIDIA or TensorRT LLM. It could mean using live, uh, you know, representation formats like Onyx um, or using um, other frameworks like VLM in order to compile your model down into something that's that's manageable uh, from a inference perspective, and that's actually kind of step one, right? Because you you, you can do that for your model, and um, you know let's let's say it works on one GPU, which is not a given. Um, it works on one GPU, and now you might want to make it go faster, right? You want to minimize, uh, well, you want to minimize three statistics, which are the Inner token latency, which is how long it takes for a token to token to be generated within the same stream. You want to minimize the time to first token, which is the time that it basically takes to take your prompt and encode it, uh, and then, well, you know, process it, and then um, get to the first token and output it. And that's usually that's usually a little bit longer than the inner token latency in some cases. Um, and then you're you're also going to want to increase the system wide throughput. Um, and what this means is, um, LMs, when you're, when you're doing LM generation, you're, you're often not doing it at, at a batch size of one. So when you are doing inference, right, uh, you actually might be doing different streams or different sequences next to each other within the context of the same batch. And despite the fact that the, um, each individual 
single stream has a has a maximum you know inter or minimum inner token latency and a minimum um, time to first token. Um, the aggregate of all the streams has a maximum amount of tokens that, that can be passed through a system at a given amount of time. So if you have a if you have a LM on on one GPU or or one or one accelerator, um, you can often use different forms of parallelism. Uh, well, a specific form of parallelism to further accelerate the model. Um, and you can play around with the way in which you are compiling the model uh, in order to minimize, you know, or basically play with different levers to ensure that you're getting the best model for you, right? Because there, there, as I mentioned, there are those, there, there are those three things, there's, there are those three numerical values that you can try and optimize for. And there's also cost, right? The more GPUs mm -hmm. you're on for per token that you're generating, that the more expensive it's going to be. Um, so you have a bunch of levers to play with there. One of them, as I mentioned, is parallelism. Um, for you know, in terms of parallelism, uh, essentially what it means is that you're you're taking some operation that that the model does or some set of operations, and you're representing it across multiple GPUs. Um, and the three common types of parallelism that you call like three D parallelism are uh, data parallel, which doesn't really matter for inference because data parallel for infl inference is just a number of different replicas of the same model. Mm -hmm. um, tensor parallel, which is essentially taking uh, large tensor like uh, map multi matrix multiplications within the context of your model and um, splitting up the math onto multiple different GPUs and then recombining to form your result. And then um, uh, pipeline parallel parallelism, where you essentially um, use the different GPUs to do different operations within the context of the execution pipeline of the model. And the fact that you are using a pipeline means that um, you can use pipeline optimization strat strategies like, like bubbling or, or, or you know, just generally how, how you would do a pipeline, right? Some, something starts something and then passes its block off to the next worker and then receives its next block. Um, and that allows you to optimize models. But really to focus on for inference, um, tensor parallelism is often used because um, essentially what you're doing when, when you're doing tensor parallelism is you're, you're decreasing the amount of storage that needs to be done on a, on a, on a single GPU. Um, uh, and you're increasing the amount of compute that's applied to a given matrix multiplication operation at the cost of the communication that you have to do of the uh, tensors to all of the um, different GPUs that are participating in tensor, tensor parallel operation. And what that means effectively, if you are on a very fast, um, if you're on a very, 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 very fast communication system, is that you can actually improve the latency of the model because you are taking the compute and the and this and specifically in it in, in um specifically the compute and the lookups that are occurring you're splitting onto two G gpus that have their own bandwidths so you're, you're kind of doubling the bandwidth in a way and you are doing the attention calculation or sorry uh, the the matrix multiplication operation spe specifically um faster Right, because you are the, the communications rate. You know, you do it very quickly, and mm -hmm. if you're on a fast network um, or InfiniBand or MBLink, um, and then you're doing the compute computation in parallel, which means you're doing it some, you know, maybe not two times faster, slightly sublinear, but you're doing it two times fast. Or you're actually doing it two times faster. It's sublinear because of the communication overhead, but um, and then you're rejoining the result, and because you are taking that you know, long portion, which is the, doing the matrix multiplication itself and splitting it up into multiple parts, the resulting inference is actually faster. Um, hmm. And so, so, so that, that's one of the levers. There are a number, number of other levers that you, you can pull. Um, for example, um, when, you're, when you're building an engine uh, or like a, a, an inference deployment, you usually have some batch size that you, you build to be the max batch size that this model can support. And um, generally, with respect to these these compilers, uh, you can actually do a couple of tricks with respect to um, 
the batch size. Like if you were to decrease the batch size to one, um, you can actually use different kernels or different techniques to optimize low batch sizes than large batch sizes, but you're actually going to end up with um, higher costs for token generated because you're not fully utilizing the, you, or you may not be full, fully, fully utilizing the, the, the GPU. Um, in the case of, um, quick question, in, in the case of batch size one, so let's say I, I compile a model to mm -hmm. batch size one, and I'll, I'll summarize what you said before just to make sure I'm, I'm following yeah. along. If you, if you go at batch size one and then you have a bunch of different replicas of batch size one, how is that different to raising your batch size to let's say 10 or 20? Um, how, how does that? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you have a batch size of N and you, uh, the difference between that and having N replicas is uh, there is an, I'd, I'd call it an economy of scale to having mm -hmm. a larger batch size. Um, so as I mentioned, um, decreasing the batch size can, can, can really increase improve your it'll likely improve your latency but because you no longer have the benefit of being able to schedule the batch next to each other sort of like have it be in the same map mole you lose some of the benefits of the ability of parallel computation right um a, a good example of this really um to to to, to make it very, very clear is um, uh, one of the ways, one of the strategies by which we do matrix multiplication is a technique called tiling. And um, uh, the performance for very, 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 very thin matrix multiplication, like you're multiplying a, a, some, vec some matrix that is like two by a million or something, um, mm. is lower per element of the matrix than if you were to use a matrix that, for example, is like N by N, right? Like a thousand, by, or not, maybe not a thousand by a thousand, but 10,000 by 10,000 or, or something like that. Even though, you know, even if they have the same number of matrix elements, um, mm -hmm. the kernel so shape that really matters, using, basically. Shape, shape, shape does matter because the, mm. the kernels that are going to be chosen to do that matrix multiplication are different, right? Because, okay. um, or, or that, or you may have to pad out your shape, right? Uh, let's say, let's say, let's say you have a four by four tiling algorithm. You may have to pad out your shape with like null values and then do the multiplication mm. with that tile size. Um, it kind of depends, right? Um, that's, that's how you deal with uneven sized matrices, right? Like a matrix with uh, some matrix length of 53, you obviously have to do something about the, you know, the edge of the matrix that's not supported because it's not an even number. Um, yep. yeah. So I wanted to summarize sort of what you shared so far. So when you're thinking mm -hmm. about, um, deploying models, there's different degrees of parallelism that you could deploy. Um, the 3D mm -hmm. parallelism, so you have data parallelism. I have multiple copies yeah. of a model yeah. uh, crunching different sets of data. That's typically, I guess, more on the training side. Then you have tensor parallel and pipeline parallel, right? Yeah, you could you could consider data parallelism sort of uh, in in a, in at inference. I call it replica parallelism, right? You have, gotcha. You have a bunch yeah. of workers, and and instead of instead of having training where they're all communicating, all of the inference is happening completely in parallel. And there's some scheduler that handles both routing the um, information to all the workers and then retrieving the results so that it's outputted correctly to the user. Makes sense. And when it comes to leveraging compilation packages on, mm -hmm. um, on GPUs, the actual batch size that you use when you compile that model is going to affect your latency simply because it'll change the size of the matrix multiplies that are happening under the hood. And depending on the yeah. sizes of the matrix multiplies, you'll choose different kernels. Can you describe what a kernel is for, for those listening? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. A, a kernel, a kernel <laughs> is uh, essentially a, um, you can think of a kernel as a function, right? It's, 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 it's an optimized function. So a kernel takes some function that, um, uh, 
you know, describe some mathematical operation between, let, let's say it's just, let's, let's start with just matrices because kernels operate on matrices for deep learning. And that's, that's a very easy example. Um, a kernel maps a function to how that function is optimally represented in hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so you may have a kernel that does convolution, right? And um, there are, uh, you know, there's a convolution kernel that represents, hey, here is how I do compilation in, in a language that GPUs will understand and will actually compile down really well on, on, on GPUs. And usually um, for, for GPUs, the kernels are written in CUDA. Um, uh, not really sure. I mean, I, there are a couple of other libraries to, to write kernels, but CUDA is the main one. Um, and, you know, a, a good example would be, um, you know, of, of how kernels actually make a difference, by the way, uh, and how kernel development and, and how working on these atomic operations makes a dif difference is in the case of a paper called uh, Flash Attention, which you know, I would encourage people to read. It's actually a very interesting study into how um, kernels relate to the performance of deep pointing systems. Uh, but the essence of that is that um, you take a kernel that does an operation and, and you actually analyze it and you realize, hey, um, you know, I may be doing something that's efficient in terms of um, like execution, like computational execution. But in, in looking at this kernel for flash attention, we actually realize, hey, like the memory accesses here are actually really poor. Um, and there are ways to improve the patterns by which we access memory so that there are less cache misses. And, um, you know, so there's a regular attention kernel and there's a flash attention kernel. And they both achieve the same result, but the flash attention kernel is just faster because it, it, it has a better um, formulation of how it solves the same problem. And that'll change across different pieces of hardware, right? So that implementation of that attention to some degree, depending on the types of cores that are available. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we're getting a little bit out of my depth here, but the understanding is that like CUDA, different versions of CUDA were built with different knowledge of hardware in mind. Um, as I'm mm -hmm, sure is mm -hmm. moderately obvious. Um, so if you look at the evolution of hardware, there are newer and newer features in CUDA that are introduced that are not backwards compatible because they map to specific functions in hardware. Um, uh, and these functions, things just change, right? So if you, if you go, to, go back to older hardware, there's not going to be kernel support for certain operations just because it's not implemented in hardware and those, those logic path, paths just don't exist. And that's just sort of a function of progress, right? Backwards compatibility is something that's like almost impossible to maintain in hardware because hardware develops over time and some logic that you may not think is important, some, you know, back in 2013 becomes incredibly important in 2023. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting when, so like the development of FP8, and now I just saw a paper that came yeah. out with FP6. So for those that are listening, they, this is the actual precision with which you do the math under the hood, and that's typically hardware dependent. So the, the newer GPUs, the H100s, and the, the Ada Lovelace generation give you that capability to, to get some higher precision, <laughs> lower memory math. Um, so... I wanted to, to ask, what do you think is the hardest part about optimizing a model for production? Um, there are a couple of things. Mm. I wouldn't call it hard per se, in that it's like a it's 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 a it's a true implementation challenge. But really understanding the axes that you want to optimize a model um, is something that I did not appreciate. Uh, you know, just coming out of college. Um, a good way to put this is like, if you look at a given model, let's use, um, I don't know, um, let's use an LLM, for example, right? Okay. You optimize a given model. We, we, we've, we've talked about sort of these, these things that we can improve within the context of our optimization and inference time. And just to list them again, it's uh, inner token latency, time to first token, um, the total throughput of, of the system, 
uh, which sort of corresponds also to the cost, right? The cost of the system. So if you're, if you're using eight GPUs and doing things massively parallel, um, you're probably going to be increasing the cost linearly. Um, and while you are getting some speed up, that speed up may be sublinear. So you're, 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 you're sacrificing a little bit in terms of the, the value in order to improve the latency. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Because you may have to factor in something like your deployment environment, uh, something like, you know, for example, oh, I only have four GPU configs, or you may have to factor in, hey, I have um, eight GPUs or six GPUs or four GPUs, but they're, the connection between them is slow because we're not using, there's no envy link between them, or, um, you know, they're, they're using PCIe or, or even, you know, possibly, you know, uh, from a memory hierarchy perspective, even worse than that, like something, they're just on a completely different node, right? Because mm -hmm. if they're on two different, if you have two different GPUs on two, diff two different nodes, the connectivity is almost always going to be worse than if they were on the same node. Right. Um, so you really do have to factor that information into the decisions that you make when, when optimizing and taking a business need and clarifying what is important within the context of the list levers is very hard unless you receive a very one, dim one dimensional mandate, right? If someone says, I want the best latency and that's what I need, uh, your mandate may actually be very easy, right? If they're like, I do not care about throughput at all. I only care about latency. Like I, could, I can use a million GPUs on this and it can just serve one person or one stream. Um, from a prioritization perspective, that's very easy. But if you have someone that says, yeah, I want some balance of cost and latency and throughput. And, um, you know, I have these constraints and I'm on this specific um, hardware. And, um, you know, here's the minimum latency that we, or the maximum latency that we can tolerate. And here's the max minimum throughput that we need to be able to achieve. Um, you start getting into the situation where like the, the exploration space that will actually solve your problem is getting small and hmm. you know it, it, it's, a, it's a lot harder when you have many 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 constraints than if you have one specific optimization objective right you may have one optimization objective but the addition of more constraints makes it more difficult that makes sense and how do you how do you advise people to start thinking about choosing hardware for an LLN deployment so for instance if i'm deploying let's say a 7b uh, so there's 7B, low traffic, low traffic, low latency. Low and there's probably like 7B, high traffic, low latency. So the, it's interesting all the different cases. And then uh, when do I go yeah. beyond, you know, any, any thoughts there? So um, here's a framework by which I think about it. Um, okay, well, let, let, let's, let's start with a couple of things. Um, let's go over the different levers you have, right? Um, so for small models, um, you can use, so you can use tensor parallelism almost anywhere, right? You can, it's sort of a universal technique. As long as you have map moles, there are ways to slice those map moles up so that they map to a bunch of different GPUs. Yep. Um, if you take a small model and apply tensor parallelism to it, um, the more GPUs you're using, the more the benefit of the, the more the you know perfect scaling starts to fall off, right? So mm -hmm. if you go to two GPUs, you you may have you know forty percent decreased latency, right? And then you add another extra mm -hmm. two, and it may decrease a little bit more. And then once you get to eight, right, the, the benefit really starts falling off because this this small matrix multiplication that you're doing, like farming it out to multiple multiple GPUs, um, the the bottleneck that existed that that makes um, that makes your tensor parallelism worth it, right? In in the case of in the case of um, att att attention, it's 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 memory and and then to a lesser extent compute. Um, those bottlenecks start to become less and less bottlenecks as you scale it out, right? Because mm -hmm. um, you're now like throwing more compute and more memory bandwidth at it. Um, so. Like as a rule of thumb, like going more and more parallel can improve your results from an absolute perspective, but you gain diminishing returns. Um, 
the same sort of goes for, um, you know, it, like other, well, other forms of parallelism is, um, is, is not really the, uh, uh, other forms of parallelism, not really similar, like, uh, data parallelism, right. Just mi creating a bunch of replicas, right. Is a linear multiple on throughput, right. Each replica is able to handle the same amount. And if you, if you were to, you know, farm it out to N replicas, you're, you're literally improving, uh, minus scheduling constraints because scheduling becomes hard when you, you know, send it out to a bunch of different machines. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you are, you are pretty much linearly scaling the throughput of the system. Um, but again, right. It depends on whether or not you're trying to optimize for something in aggregate. Um, right. Like if you're just trying to optimize throughput in aggregate, really what you should be doing is taking the smallest size that you get good. You, well, you, you should take the smallest size that is not constrained by the size it's on. So for example, mm -hmm. like, uh, like, like llama seven B you said seven B model. If you were, if you were to optimize for throughput, you would want to just do a bunch of one GPU copies of that. Um, and put it on N GPUs, however many, however many GPU copies you have, because if you don't care about latency, then you're going to get the highest throughput from that. Um, right. right. Because there's, you know, by going parallel or by going parallel in other ways in going tensor parallel, you are introducing slight costs, right? There's overhead, right? With respect to communication, you're introducing communication mm -hmm. overhead. Yeah. Um, and so, so just so that people understand when you do tensor parallel, you're splitting this model, some big, typically some big matrix multiply into these parallel operations, but then to finish the matrix multiply, you need to do a communication at the end of that operation to say, to combine all those values. That's the communication. Yeah, that's bottleneck. exactly it. Right. So, so there's the cost, there's a cost to communicate to all of those workers what their what their work is right so you have to send out the, the matrix initially and then they do their work in parallel and then they rejoin at the end um yep and and, and that communication pattern will change within a node how much latency that adds within a node versus hopping across nodes as well right that's why you typically yeah yeah so so um this is actually a, another really interesting conversation, which is just what what the memory hierarchy of a GPU is. Okay. Um, right. So, so uh, this is this is this is a little bit um, off topic, but um, in the context of a data center, a GPU has a specific memory hierarchy, right? In terms of what it has access to the fastest. Hmm. So. Uh, for GPUs, and I wish I had a, a diagram here because it's easy to represent, but for GPUs, the fastest access you're going to have is if you have a cache hit on one of the levels of your cache, right? So if you're doing computation and you access a value you've recently accessed, you get a cache hit. And that's super fast. That's, a, that's blindingly fast. And um, uh, flash attention versus att attention, which I mentioned earlier, is maximizing those cache hits. That, that, was, mm. that was what was what the optimization for from flash attention was. Um, and then you go a level higher, right? And you go to the VRAM, which everyone's probably experienced, you know, like out of memory, right? That's the memory that's, that's talked about when we talk about VRAM. Hmm. Um, and then you start talking about stuff outside of the GPU, right? It, you, you've hit the edge of the world of GPU. And I'm oversimplifying here because there's actually a couple of levels within a GPU. Well, let's, let's, let's ignore that for a moment. Um, and you start going outside of the GPU. And there are multiple sort of, let's talk about GPUs within the context of the same node, the same computational unit, right? Usually eight GPUs. Um, if you go outside the context of a single GPU on a node, then you start having to talk to the other GPUs on the node. And there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can do that over the, um, well, um, it, for PCIe-enabled cards, you can do that over PCIe. And if they're NVLink-enabled, you can also do it via NVLink, right? Um, and a lot of nodes these days, if you're going into any data center, probably have it NVLink because there's, it's very, very nice to have because it improves this communication a lot. Um, and then there are other connectivity options, like you can have um, InfiniBand um, or uh, you know, other forms of uh, direct memory access. But um, we're going to ignore those as well. Um, so 
communication within a node is usually very fast. NVLink is itself very, very, very fast relative to other forms of communication. Um, and that's that's sort of the, the thing, the hierarchy in the node. Like you you mo you probably want NVLink, like you know, InfiniBand is also good um, to connect to host memory and to to, to other machines. Um, and then you know, going over PCIe or like you know, is 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 if it, if it is a PCIe card is probably uh, the worst option in a lot of cases. Um, and then you go to other nodes, right? And other nodes become even more complicated because you, you probably do use InfiniBand 100% of the time. Like there, there, there are some systems that have NVLink node to node. Um, they're, they're, they've been, um, you know, proposed or revealed. Um, but uh, again, like not every system these days has that, right? They're, that's that's a that's mm -hmm. a that's a relatively in the in the scope of the last 10 years. That's a that's a relatively new thing. Um, and once you go to other nodes, right, the GPU memory and the memory on those other nodes is worse because you have to do even more communication relative to if it were on the same node. So from a GPU's perspective, the easiest access memory is itself, and then this, the GPU is on the same node, and then the GPU is on other nodes. And then like, there's an even worse option, which is um, if you have a uh, Multiple data centers. Let's let's, let's say you're doing a ten thousand GPU training of two five thousand GPU data centers. You almost always never want communication between those two data centers. You want to minimize it because that is really mm. costly. There's very low bandwidth between two individual data centers. Um, well, that's yeah. super interesting. Um, yeah, when, before I came to Nvidia, I had I was completely clueless about the actual constraints when it comes to both training and inference on how much of an impact your actual storage and network come into play completely oh, yeah. disregarding the, the GPU itself. Um, so for those listening, if you are using more than one GPU, even if you're using a single GPU, uh, your storage and networking, if you see differences in performance, oftentimes across the same type of cards, it's typically your, your networking and storage that will, will be one of your culprits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that that's actually one one hard one very interesting thing about analyzing like performance, which is um, you could be on the same GPU, and you can have completely wildly different different performance based on if, if especially if you're doing parallel operations based on mm -hmm. just connectivity alone. Um, it's it's certainly one thing to to look at when you're when you're considering the, you know the performance of a system. Uh, so, what's the minimum size of model that you've seen in your experience, where Tensor parallel gives you a benefit. Is it the seven AB? Is it the four AB model? Naturally, that's dependent on what GPU you have. Um, um, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so as mentioned, right, uh, the math, and I, and I would do it if I had a whiteboard here, but I don't. Yeah. Um, the math, the math reduces to how much overhead communication is incurring relative mm. to what the bottleneck is. So if there's no compute or memory bottleneck, right? If, if something else is the bottleneck in the system, uh, there's, no, there's no reason to go tensor parallel, right? Because that, that's what tensor parallel, the parallelism does. It, farm, it, it splits the, those costs up onto different GPUs. But if you're already on one GPU and those costs aren't the most bottleneck part of your model, um, uh, tensor parallelism is unlikely to give benefit other than Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, it's not likely to give latency benefit. Um, gotcha. Because, um, right, if, if other costs dominate, um, then like adding the, the communication overhead may be, may be costly. Um, uh, you know, for example, like you start getting into the 13B range, and um, it's certainly worth it to go tensor parallel. Um, hmm. And uh, for some larger size of models like Llama 70B, if you're not doing a lot of quantization or, or weight offloading, um, uh, in order to like represent it fully on the GPU, you actually just need to, you need to go tensor parallel. Um, gotcha. But the question becomes how much how tensor parallel you become because you can you can serve Llama 70B on four GPUs, or you could serve it on eight, and it'll the eight will be faster. You know, it'll it'll have it'll have lower latency and and a, and a better per user per stream experience, or mm -hmm. not per stream but per sequence experience. Um, and the but the results in value will be lower than if you'd used four. 
Um, yeah, so, just because you, you know, have to pay as, more communication penalty across the GPUs versus the four. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, so um, we go back to sort of the discussion about like the scaling in terms of throughput of data parallel is, is perfect because the workers actually never interact at all, right? So you, you are incurring some level of overhead with respect to throughput when you go tensor parallel as opposed to data parallel. Um, because you're introducing this communication cost. Makes sense. Um, what, yeah. what should directors and so <laughs> there's the different hierarchies of, of, of people yeah. who are responsible for getting these things to production. What should director yeah. level folks and VP folks be thinking about <clears throat> when they go to deploy large language models? You should come in with a very good knowledge of what your actual constraints are. Um, before you even consider like what, how are you going to deploy it? You really want to understand what is the target hardware we want to deploy on. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying this from the perspective of an engineer. I realize that the business problems do make this harder <laughs> um, and you may need more data to make this decision. But from an engineer's perspective, a perfect view is if you come in and, and say, you know, oh, I, I want to optimize this, this model. I know what hardware platform I want to use. And I, I only want to optimize one thing and have no constraints. Um, and that, that becomes like not an easy problem, but it's easier than if there are many constraints because the finding your way around many constraints is, is a little bit harder. Um, but coming in with the knowledge that I want this specific, like being very clear about like, exact requirements maybe even being a, a bit loose with them and saying like hey this is this is the thing we want but we're willing to you know move a little bit on it saying i want this latency i want this throughput i want this value um while you know it adds constraints uh finding out about the constraints at the start of the project is much easier than finding about finding out about constraints in the middle of a project right so you should go in with at least a good knowledge of like what your constraints are and before you go to the drawing board, you should say, here's the cost that we need to hit per token. Here's the latency we expect. Here's the, here's the total number of users we need to serve or total number of like tokens we need to generate per second. And having those allows you to make much more informed decisions when you're designing the system initially um, and, and also sort of reduces the need to redesign um, because you know all the constraints beforehand. Makes sense. Can you talk about what you're working on right now with AI foundation models and sort of what, what's the mission with that project? Yeah. So, um, I, 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 I am an engineering lead for a project called, um, and manager for context, uh, I, uh, for a project called, um, AI foundation models and endpoints at NVIDIA. And, um, the purpose of the, the purpose of AI foundation models and endpoints is actually to give people an opportunity to try models that are hyper accelerated on nvidia gpus um so uh right now people can go for free to our and uh, website which i can maybe show in a moment or mark can include later in the in, in the in the description of the video and you can go experience models uh for for experimental use um in the context of a ui that is you can play with it and chat with a model in a chatbot format or you can insert uh, you know you can you can you know, insert prompts for your SD generator and, and see outputs visualized in the UI. Or alternately, you can actually start like building systems um, on top of the API. Um, so we, we also provide API access to these models via a, a token, similar, similarly to how you would for OpenAI. Um, these models are also accessible through other me methods, like the fact that we have like a LangChain connector that can be plugged into stuff like Llama Index if you want to build agents or, or use these endpoints to do something interesting in that, in, in that domain. Um, and the charter here really is, you know, figuring out these optimal configurations for these models to put up on AI Foundation models and endpoints and to ensure that the we have like stuff like high system uptime and that um we you know are 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 generally you know providing a great experience to users with respect to getting started with deep learning or experiencing deep learning in their systems and um yep. the, the the other the other great thing about it is um 
you know, like we sort of link some of these models with calls to action. So for example, um, if you, um, if you want to fine tune a model, right, you can go to that model experience it on the site and then say, for example, experience that same model within the context of one of the NVIDIA training libraries, like Nemo multimodal or, um, or, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, for example, uh, experience this model through, um, uh, tensor, tensor RTL, um, documentation, if you want to build it yourself. Um, so it, it sort of serves as a front page by which people can interact with, with models and then sort of see how they link into the NVIDIA ecosystem or places that you can engage. Very cool. Yeah. I, I like, I like the project just because I think anyone deploying, um, either a hybrid approach or a fully open source approach, the, the question always comes up. Okay, which one of these great open source models do I use? Then you have yeah. to go set it up. Then you have to go compile all of them to optimally get the best latency after you've de decided a particular accuracy that you like. So this and mm -hmm. these endpoints, you can just sign up for it, generate a key, hit all of these different models and determine which one of them works really well for your use case. Um, so yeah. it's a nice yeah. problem you guys are solving. Yeah, it's it's um, validating. It's 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 really cool to see what people have built and what people do with um, what we provided. And um, I'm you know excited, more excited going into the future because we're working on a lot of really cool models that 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 can do things that maybe don't work within our catalog, right? Like with stuff, or sorry, they occupy functions that didn't previously previously exist in our model catalog because we're up to something like twenty five now. A uh, recent release was dplot, which is a model that can actually strip the values out of charts, right? It, it can take a chart mm. and say like, oh, what are the nu numeric values associated with this chart? And, and it can do that, right? And, um, you know, in, in conjunction with that and a bunch of other systems, there's super interesting things you can do because you can, for example, like say, read a S10, which is like a, a financial document. And you can say like, oh, what are the numbers in this chart? And you can pull it out without having to um, do the analysis or like look point to point or even do like pixel measurement to see exactly where it is, um, which I think is 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 super interesting. Um, and then you What's can- What's the name you know, of that library? Dplot? Uh, Dplot, D-E-P-L-O-T. Uh, it's, oh, it's a model okay. that was created by Google based on pix to struct, if I remember correctly. Mm. Super interesting. Um, yeah. <clears throat> fine tuning is, is a big thing or, or adapting a language model to your business context. Uh, this concept of LoRa, LoRa adapters, having a small yeah. representation of a task base model, having a bunch of different uh, task specific LoRa's, meaning task specific uh, efficient matrices that do different tasks. Um, mm -hmm. What are you sort of seeing as like the state of the art when it comes to deploying Laura's because that I think that's sort of an open game right now. Yeah. Uh, my answer to that would be it's still evolving, right? Um, okay. You know, uh, I think that there are a bunch of really interesting topics in this domain, like, for example, uh, doing something like multi Laura's where mm -hmm. you may have the same base model, but hundreds of different Laura's that are associated with that base model that are that may be served you know, differently at, at, uh, inference time. And I, I wouldn't say it like there's definitely work on it and there's, there definitely, there have definitely been huge strides in the space, but I don't think that like figuring out how to do parameter efficient fine tuning techniques, which you described, which include Laura's, um, IA three, um, uh, prompt tuning, um, or sorry, P tuning. Um, the those techniques, while you know super useful and uh, and 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 be are currently being explored, don't really have like a a resolved way to to fully serve them. Uh, multi Laura mm -hmm. is something that's emerged as as a way to serve a lot of Lauras within the context of the same place, and and there are libraries that support it. But I would not say that the deployment pattern for Lauras is completely settled yet, and um, you know. 
at, at, you know, here at NVIDIA, I'm, I'm sure that we have some really, really smart people working on it. And, um, you know, they, they, there, there, there will probably be some very interesting way to do it. And it'll probably be in ubiquitous, right? And people will figure it out and it'll be in a bunch of different libraries and it'll be super interesting. Um, sure. hmm. yeah. Stair Alum, are you familiar with the inner workings yeah, of, yeah. of how Stair Alum? Can you, not, can you describe what? Not very familiar what? with the workings. Uh, for, 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 for those level. that don't know. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a really cool new alignment technique that came out of NVIDIA. Um, alignment for context is basically taking a, uh, large language model that's been pre-trained on, on basically like, what is the next word in text and actually like training it to do, um, to be aligned with like human requests or like safety. Um, and, um, essentially, uh, CLM is a new alignment technique that was proposed by NVIDIA that actually uses numerics to describe different aspects of the model. So for example, uh, you may want to control a model uh, and make it like very sterile and logical without having it be trying to try to be humorous or try to be like maybe like wordy or creative, right? You may want just like a very short, succinct answer. Um, and SteerLM actually allows you to control this in the model by introducing this concept of steering values. Um, so steering values are basically values that describe different, new, different. I wouldn't call them qualitative aspects, maybe, maybe, maybe we can call them qualitative aspects of the model numerically or quantitatively. So for example, um, you have like a rating like, like, oh, like funniness, right? Humor between zero and 10. And in the directive to the model, you can say, hey, I want a humor 10, creativity five, um, you know, prompt generation, right? And it'll tell a joke. And if you say humor zero, creativity zero, it's going to give you like a one word answer to logical one word answer to your prompt. Um, so generally, it's, it's a new way of sort of being able to control the model other than just raw prompting where you'll like say like, hey, don't try and be funny. Right, like just give me the logical mm -hmm. answer, right? So instead of that, you can just drop humor or, or creativity down, and 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 that allows you to control the model in that way. Yeah, and I like I like the fact that it's on a per request level, and it, yes. there, to some degree, it does save on your um on your prompt budget as well, right? Because you just have a limited number of characteristics that you send with every request. Yes, that... yeah, it's 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 bounded, so you don't have to like craft a really long prompt to get it to be funny. Um, I mean, of mm -hmm. course, if, if you, if you want it to be funny in a specific way, you, you may actually need to prompt it to do that. But if you just want something that's funny, right? Like setting this numeric to 10 is far less tokens than trying to prompt the model to do something specific or have a specific behavior. Usually. Mm -hmm. So it sounds it, like, I, I, um, I was going to say at minimum, right? That prompt is like a sentence. So um, yes. you're adding, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like a character or two characters versus a sentence. One, one topic that, that's quite interesting is the, this notion of a KV cache and, and how much memory that typically occupies um, mm -hmm. and how that factors into your, your average uh, time to first token. Can you talk about, can you describe high level what is a KV cache, why it's important for yeah. people to maybe keep that in mind? Yeah, so um, we talked about caching earlier, right? Some operations, if you ever reuse things, um, a cache is a really good way to decrease the memory burden on those things because instead of um, you know instead of hitting a the actual maybe slow piece of memory, uh, so just for context, a cache a cache hit is much faster than hitting VRAM in a, in a GPU. Uh, a cache is much slower than and um, doing. Uh, sorry, a cache hit is much faster than than going to the memory that that sits behind it. And if there's a miss, it just goes to the memory behind it and grabs it from there. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, a KV cache is sort of a cache for some of the components of attention that can be reused over time, right? So um, essentially without going very deep in, into it, what it allows you to do is since you're doing an autoregressive problem where you're continuously generating the next token, and um, since you have 
um, some form of, uh, you know, causal attention, right? Where the words attend to stuff in the future of the sentence. Um, you can have a cache of the, um, you can have a cache of the attention values that are used earlier in the sentence, which are, you know, then updated and used. And since they're in the cache, you don't actually have to go back to memory or you, you don't have to, it's, it's, it's faster than, sorry, it's, it's faster than going all the way out to memory or recomputing these values. So you could completely throw away these values and then recompute them every time you do the auto regressive loop, or you can store them and, um, then you don't have to, you don't have to compute them again. So, um, instead of, instead of being about lookups, right. You're, you're not preventing a lookup. You're, you're pre pre preventing recomputation. Um, yep. and that's, that's what the KV cache is for. But as Mark mentioned, uh, KV cache actually does consume a resource, right? It consumes memory. Um, so, um, with respect to that, um, you know, I talked a little bit about manipulating the bat the batch size. The manipulating the bat batch size changes the size of the KV cache. So, mm. um, like in terms of um, in terms of optimizations, um, there's some techniques for LLMs that, that consume memory, right? And some optimization plans that consume memory. Um, and if your KV cache is super large, or if you're using if you're using a KV cache and it's super large. Um, it may prevent those from being used because you're, you're using, you know, you're using such a large KV cache, and, it, and, it, and it's and it's 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 a balance here, right? Because the KV cache is also a performance improving, like object, mm -hmm. in the context of 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 this, um, in the context of um, deep learning and, and LMs. But at the same time, you need memory for other stuff other than just the KV cache. So the reason why I asked a lot of these in-depth questions, I, I think, is to uh, to get people to appreciate how complex LLM inference can be, especially as you start to to scale out different types of hardware, multiple different types of models. Um, mm -hmm. so, so as we round out this topic, uh, do you have any other advice for for people when they think about deploying LLMs, both at reasonable on large scale, because I think that mindset is, is quite different. Yeah. Um, there's one thing I didn't talk about, which is scheduling. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, so we talked about batch size, right? And uh, sort of one of the assumptions that maybe comes to mind with batch size is that it's a static batch. Um, Okay. Which is like, oh, I get all these sequences at the same time and I'm able, I'm able to process them. And that's kind of like a perfect world situation for one specific reason, which is if you consider, let's say you're just running on one node and there's no other external such scheduling constraints. You don't have to worry about all the other data parallel nodes that you're, you're doing inference on. If you're just looking at that one node, then the, in essence, the, I should put this. You're having requests come in at different times, right? People aren't just like sending them in one second increment, increments and batching. Mm -hmm. And you you can do something very very, you know, simple, which is just like, oh, you you basically accrue, um, you accrue elements of the batch until the next batch is it, until the GPU is ready to accept the next batch, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the problem with that is there because of how load works, there's actually no guarantee that you're going to fill up an entire batch. And, um, you know, you, if you don't fill up another batch and you're waiting for the, this not full batch to complete and you have requests that are waiting to be serviced, right? The time for first token for those requests is actually going to be really bad because, uh, instead of just waiting for the generation loop on the GPU, you're actually waiting for the previous generation loop to complete. And if you're doing static batching, you're not just waiting for the previous generation loop to complete. You're actually waiting for the longest previous generation loop, loop to complete. Because mm -hmm. if you have a batch that is different sequence links or different output links, um, the it's gonna the batch is only going to complete once it's it's completed that. Um, so there's this new, maybe not new. It's 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 a it's a feature of a lot of these um, serving libraries called in-flight batching. And what it does is um, these generation loops are auto regressive, right? So you 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 have many tokens that are that are you, you generate a token and then you put that back and you generate the next and the next and the next and the next. 
And in essence, um, in-flight batching takes the fact that you have this autoregressive generation loop and it allows you to essentially uh, schedule in batches that are not batches, uh, sequences that come in while stuff is being processed. So you sort of, you sort of have this continuous process where you're kind of stuffing, you know, you, let's imagine you have a bunch of different tracks or like rails. Um, and some of your rails are, 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 are active at a given moment. And if a new request comes in and there's an open rail, your scheduler comes in and it tries to like kind of slot it into that rail and, and get it into the, into the generation loop. Um, and in-flight batching has this effect where it's like um, performance is always a, a question of overhead, right? So in-flight batching has this scheduling overhead, which is trying to figure out like how you can slot in something to this new rail. And uh, there's overhead associated with that. Um, so you're paying an overhead cost, but what you're doing is you're, at, you're actually making um, time first token lower because right like you if you if there's ever room on one of those rails your sequence is going to hit that rail and you don't have to wait for the longest one to finish um and in a sense like your occupancy of the um of the generation loop is is denser right like you're you're essentially ensuring that like there's no case in which you have uh you know three rail, let's say there are four rails, let's say there are three rails with the sequence length of N and then there's one rail that generates, has a sequence length of like four N, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a huge waste of the compute or the, or the, the occupancy of that, those rails. So in-flight batching prevents that problem, but introduces overhead, which may, may mean that like relative to this pure static batching in the, in the best case, in-flight batching is going to be slower because it has the scheduling overhead, um, but only slightly slower. It's not going to, it's not going to be and when I say slower, I actually mean it, it may be lower throughput, right? Again, it changes it changes it changes these equations a little bit. Um, <laughs> so folks yeah. should consider that's, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, sorry. No, no, I was just saying folks should should consider using in flight batching if they want to maximize to some degree the utilization of the hardware and also to process it seems like a decent amount of requests per unit time. Um yeah. So, so in the in the best case, right? If 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 we were getting static batches and they were all the same length, uh, there would be no way to beat. Um, sure. There would be that, no way to beat static batches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in-flight batching is in the case where you have like a like a large scale distributed system where you have like a large people a large large amount of actual users interacting with something or, or systems interacting with something where stuff doesn't happen in a very rigid, structured, enforced way. Uh, mm -hmm. In-flight batching does provide some performance benefits and, and you should likely consider it for deployments where you're, where you're not just, where you, where you don't have full control of what's going into the generation loop. If you have full control of what's going into the, gen, into the generation loop, um, uh, static batching may be better um, in some cases. Good point. So another, another topic that you're an expert on is graph neural networks. I would say you're you're probably uh, more versed on the graph neural networks just because you spent more time on that. And it's interesting, the, the LLM, uh, what you call it? X LLMs are fairly new compared to graph neural networks to a degree. You feel free to contend me on that. Um, that's uh, my, I mean, my going in assumption. I guess, I guess it sort of depends. Um, I would actually say that from a first paper perspective, they're actually similar in age. Um, okay. I mean, interesting. Maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm getting that my numbers <laughs> wrong, but I seem to remember. Uh, attention is all you need. Um, is 2016. 17, I think. And 2017. Sorry, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe the first GNN paper was. Well, it sort of depends on what you attribute to being a GNN, actually. But uh, okay. Like some of the, the first big ones that I'd attribute to being like very, very, very usable in production mm. were of a, a similar era. If, if I'm right, it's 2016 as well, or 2016 uh, instead of 2017. So it, it's, it's around the same time. Um, mm. the, um, but you're sort of right in that like the current LLM boom, which started maybe in 2021, is certainly a, a little bit younger than like 
a lot of the contemporary work in in, in GNNs. Um, not to say that there isn't new work in GNNs. It's just like you know, like LM sort of had has had a long his, have, have have had a, lar- a long history, and then there's been a resurgence with ChatGPT, and that resurgence is relatively new. So yeah, I I, I get what you were saying there, but it's uh, yeah, they're, they're about the same age to, to me in my mind. Um, Sounds good. So can you can you talk about GNNs? So describe GNNs at a high level. Uh, why are they sort of when are they the best approach or when do they perform best? Um, yeah. Yeah. The start GNNs are, yeah. GNNs are very good at representing um, large unstructured data. Um, and uh, well, they're good at representing large unstructured data. They're also good at just representing general graph data. So what, what I mean when I say graph is, is sort of the, the computer science um, type of graph, right? So you have a, a series of nodes and edges that connect those nodes. And uh, essentially, the, you know, um, essentially, what a graph neural network aims to do is to generate a representation of those nodes and edges and use that to solve problems, making predictions with the nodes and edges. So some application spaces for GNNs include stuff like um, fraud detection, figuring out stuff about social networks, um, drug discovery, because you can represent molecules as uh, graphs. Um, and it's, you, essentially, you can take those graph formats, right? Because you, you know, in the, let's take for the fraud case, for example, which you have people that interact with other people, make payments, and you're trying to, for example, predict whether or not like someone will make a payment to another or whether what the probability that someone would actually do that is. And if the probability is low, it's probably fraud. Um, so those cases um, are really where GNNs shine, where you have like this large graph and you uh, are trying to process it. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, not process it. We're trying to generate representations out of it that uh, provide value. Um, it's a you know a lot of graph work is is a form of representation learning. Um, so yeah, I so essentially, worked in graphs. Sorry. So quick thing. So essentially, I'm moving. I'm taking some complex graph that can have many different types of relations. Uh, mm-hmm. Typically, when you query graphs, you have to use that specific type of graph query language to to try to find similarity. And now I come into some vector space where my similarity is now described by um, some inner product distance or some vector space distance, but it's now yeah. respecting all of the constraints that I had in my graph, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great way of putting it. That, that's, so sorry, uh, to, to clarify, that, that's one of the early, or like the, 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 the most common forms of representation learning that showed up early, which is, I can do learning on my graph without it, without any true labels, right? The graph itself is a label because we, we know what's connected to each other. Um, and we can generate representations that are similar for stuff that is actually connected and dissimilar for stuff that is not. And you can use similarity metrics that include, you know, just the dot product, or you can train like a non, like a non Euclidean embedding by instead of doing that using a, a, an actually like a deep learning model or like an MLP to take the two representations and combine them to perform, uh, to, to basically create a value between zero and one that represents the probability that that actually exists. So you do end up learning like a custom metric sort of based on your graph structure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A custom metric based on your graph. And, um, again, it's, it's less interpretable because you can't like visualize stuff in an embedding space. But it, yes. it may have higher saliency because you're you're not you can enforce, um, you, you can enforce stuff that doesn't have to necessarily be Euclidean in the space, right? Like the the MLP can can encode much more complex relationships than just whether or not they're close to close to each other in Euclidean space. Hmm. Um, but yeah, a large technique because it's interpretable and it's because it's consumable by a lot of other things is this is this. Um, just dot product, whether or not the dot product is is lower, right? Yes. Uh, any thoughts on when should folks start thinking about using GPUs to do GNNs? That that's oftentimes, I think, a big barrier to entry. Um, yeah, and I'll, that's, that's I'll, a I'll ask the, the follow up question after that. 
Um, when should people start thinking about GPUs? I, I mean, I would say um, GPUs are in very, very, you know, current generations of GPUs are very good at sparse math. Um, there's a lot of sparse math that exists and a lot of GNN operations are sparse math. Um, so I would actually say if you're, if you're using graphs of any size, you can try it out. Um, okay. The one kind of caveat there, maybe not caveat, but thing to think about is if your graph is really large, if it's terabytes on terabytes and terabytes, you actually have to fig figure out a strategy to represent that graph in a way that's actually accessible to GPUs. And that goes mm -hmm. back to our conversation about like memory and the memory hierarchy for, for GPUs. So how does, how does a GPU actually accelerate uh, GNN training? I was kind of curious as to, um, is that a, like on a neighborhood level? Any, any yeah, thoughts there? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of methods of acceleration. GNN, um, so you can do whole graph training on a GNN where you process the entire graph at once and do like all mm -hmm. the, uh, for context, one of the largest mechanisms in um, GNN training is something called message passing, where you take your state and you take, you take in all of your neighbors or adjacent node states and you combine them together to form a new state for you in, in the next n plus one layer of the GNN. And um, in that situation, um, if the graph is small enough, you can actually just do that completely within the context of a single GPU and single operation. So your batch size can be the entire graph. Um, hmm. Oftentimes, graphs are not that small, so you can't do that. Um, and you'll have to use uh, something called sampling, which is basically the idea that you can start in, on a single node, and then you can sample its neighborhood, which is basically the, the, the nodes that are n hops away. Or you can sample some part of the neighborhood. You don't have to sample all of the connections, right? Uh, because you have this um, interesting perspective where you actually may want to limit the amount that, that it gets sampled in case you hit a super node. And, and an example of a super node would be in the case of like e-commerce, right? Like Amazon is probably a super node because it does you know, a ton of business with a, a ton of individual people. And if you were to, for example, fully sample all the neighbors of Amazon, you get too many. But if you limit it to like 20, you're, you're going to get some random sampling that may not be actually representative of all of Amazon, right? Because it's not capturing the entire distribution, but is a computationally bounded problem that is not, you know, something that could explode to the size of the entire graph again. Um, so going back a step, uh, we talked about GNNs uh, and, and, and when, to, when to start on GPUs. If your graph is very large, you have to do you have you have to do sampling in order to minimize the size of the computational problem. And um, the GPU GPUs can accelerate sampling. Um, there's a great library from NVIDIA called KuGraph that does that. Um, KuGraph has a has a um, has a has a library that allows you to uh, sample the graph on GPU or sample or even perform some interesting splits of it on, on GPU CPU. And then there's another there's another um, there's another um, set of libraries, um, you know, that that accelerate uh, the actual operations that happen within the context of the message passing, which is the, the calculation of of your and your neighbor states. Um, uh, there are a bunch of algorithms that we have accelerated on GPUs that exist within KuGraph that can also be used to accelerate uh, GNNs. Perfect. Uh, so when, how should someone? actually get started on their GNN journey. I, I, I often find that GNNs are a very nuanced topic. I don't see mm -hmm. a ton of folks, you know, maybe go after it. And so any advice there? Because you spend some time. Yeah. Um, a large portion of it is actually just figuring out how to represent your problem. Um, that's, it's hard to get started, right? There's, there's like an inertia there that's like, this is something that's hard to do. And because it's hard to do, um, you know, like it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's hard to get started. Um, uh, representing your problem effectively is, is, is often like one of the, one of the first challenges that you encounter. And, um, part of it is realizing that there are multiple ways that you can predict on your graph. Um, as I mentioned before, there's sort of a method of prediction that you can train without labels called link prediction, where the graph itself is the label, right? whether or not a connection exists between two nodes is the thing that you can use to, to train on. Um, you can also predict stuff about the nodes themselves if the nodes are associated with numerical values. Like if someone has like 
you know, in the fraud detection case, like what is someone's monthly running balance? Mm -hmm. That's, that's something that may be stored on a, on a node and you may have information on the edges too. Um, so you can actually formulate your problems. You either predict whether the link exists, predict something about the node or predict something about an edge. Um, okay. And then with that information, you, you largely want to structure your problem so that you can, um, so, so that it is, it is, it is actually represented as a graph. And, and for reference, almost everything can be represented as a graph. Um, even, even images, right? You can represent pixels as a graph where adjacent pixels are connected to each other in the graph. Yeah. Um, but the, the core key thing is realizing that um, if, you have, if you have a database that has a number of keys that represent, uh, the keys in a primary table that, that, that are linked to other tables, right? Um, uh, those keys in some way or other either represent edges or nodes, right? So for example, um, you may have a core, you, you may have a core table that represents uh, a bunch of transactions. And if you want to build a graph about it, maybe not the most ideal, but a graph, one way that you can view that is a transaction is a interaction between two ent entities, right? So you, mm -hmm. you probably have who mm -hmm. sent the money and who they sent it to. So those are, those are two entities. And maybe, maybe there's actually, maybe there's actually a, um, a third element of the graph, which is, you know, the context in which they send, them, sent, sent it in, right? Which state? So you could have a graph where you have the two, the two nodes that are the entities and then the um, maybe a, a larger overall context bubble, which is connected to those entities or connected to this, this edge that represents something. Or you can represent the edge just as a single edge that contains all this information. Um, and it's really up to experimentation to figure that out what that is. But the, the point is, you take this table, you consider what are the entities in this table, the, what are the entities that are actually interacting in the system, and then you connect them by edges. And that's, that's really the, the starting point for, for building your graph. Um, and then as you build it up, you, you try and figure out how you insert features onto the graph on either the nodes or edges and say, hey, maybe there's a value associated with this transaction. So that value is going to land on an edge. It's going to be a feature of an edge. So, so, so maybe, maybe it lands on an edge, or maybe you have someone's account balance and that lands on the node. Um, and you can build up these, these features that are essentially on all of these edges or nodes, or you can insert a, a learnable embedding and, and it, it can actually just learn features for, for those users. Hmm. Um, it really depends on which application and, and, and how sparse or dense your, your feature network is. Excuse me. It all makes sense to me why there's a lot of inertia to, <laughs> to getting started with yeah, GNNs, yeah. but, um, it, it does seem like a quite powerful approach. So I wanted to, to shift in your career. So one of the things that I've enjoyed about watching your career journey um, is that, uh, let's not play the ageism card, but, but more so from the perspective of uh, you have a bachelor's and I've seen you uh, be very successful at NVIDIA with, with mm -hmm. a bachelor's. And I think, for instance, like I have a PhD. So, so we look at these, let's just measure degrees. Mm -hmm. What's your career optimization function for how you pursue, you know, at, at this stage in your career? Is it, um, are you optimizing for wealth? Are you optimizing for time? Are you optimizing for learning? What are the things that drive you to, to do what you do at this point? Um, I really, really enjoy solving hard problems. Um, and for me, my optimization function right now reduces to where am I empowered to solve hard problems and where am I getting the resources to do so? Mm. Um, right. Because there's many, there are many things that I want to do, many things that I want to try. Um, and um, right now I'm optimizing for, Hey, I want to work on this project because I think it's interesting. I think that there's a lot of potential for, you know, either innovation to come or like, engineering innovation, which is like solving an applied problem. Um, and that's generally what I optimize for right now. Like I, um, well, it's a nice side effect, I guess. Um, yes. But uh, for me, there is a great amount of joy to be found in solving hard problems. And 
solving them with people. I really love collaborating mm-hmm. with others. And right now at NVIDIA, I'm, I'm very happily doing that, um, working on hard problems with brilliant people. So um, when, you, when you come upon a hard problem, what's the first thing you tell yourself? Like, what's your self-talk like when you get an aggressive? My self-talk is like, (laughs) I I don't know, I get excited. I get get excited, right? I'm like, hey, this is is something that's actually hard. Um, Hmm. How do we crack this problem? And the problem can be as simple as debugging, right? Um, The the problem could be, wow, you know, after on our a millionth and one inference call to this to this service, it fails. Why is that the case? Right. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. just like, that is a hard challenge to solve. Or maybe let's even say it's, it's worse. It's, it's non-deterministic. Somewhere between a million and two million calls, this, this fails. Um, which, by the way, does happen. You find bugs like this occasionally. Um, it's, 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 it's less of a, I mean, it's, a, it's an encumbrance, certainly, because you need to solve it. But the process of solving it is engaging and rewarding because you are learning more about the system you are working on. Um, even if you built it, right? Even if you built the system on, on, on top of other libraries and you know at the library level exactly what, get, what gets used, like you can always learn deeper things about the system you're working on. Unless you're that guy that built like an entire computer out of transistors on a breadboard that he himself assembled. But I don't know many of those people. Um, so... Well, no, I, I wanted to ask a, a slightly different question. How do you maintain, because now you're, you're on a different sort of career trajectory. You're a lead, you're a manager. So how do you, as you start to climb essentially that part of the corporate ladder, how do you maintain your technical skills? Because I know you as like a super hardcore technical person, IC type, type vibe. Um, yeah, so the, the answer to that is that you actually make have to make time for that right so it's a prioritization question mm. um because you can inter- okay. in, it certainly um say like oh i'm only going to do management and you can you can do that right there's always management work to do there's always some form of strategic you know strategic alignment people management um uh like expectation management uh, execution management that you have to do as a manager there's always something and sort of the realization that like you, you you have to make time to still do technical stuff, um, or you need to do it outside of work, um, which I've I've sort of mixed both of right. Like I I enjoy doing hackathons and and working on stuff on my own, um, and yeah, it's sort of you either have to find it, you have to make time to do it during the day, or you do it at the end of the day which is both are fine, right? Like I, for, for example, um, advent of chat GPT, I, uh, I, I got really interested in iOS development for some reason. And I, 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 um, I, I realized that chat GPT for, for some very specific reason, I have no idea why was super good at writing from my perspective, super good, maybe not as good as an expert programmer, but from my perspective as an knowledge programmer, pretty good at writing um, Sprite Kit code in in, I, in iOS uh, Swift. Hmm. Um, uh, and I was like, I, I've always loved um, like 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 uh, card games. Uh, there's a card game I love called Slay the Spire. It's a fantastic game. Mm-hmm. A lot of math involved in that uh, that I that I really enjoy. Um, but and. Uh, I I loved I was super into Slay the Spire at the time, so I was like, "Hey, why don't I implement a card game like that?" And um, doing stuff like, you know, figuring out how to uh, a represent the cards in a fan that like actually works, like figure out like the the math behind a card fan is like a very simple challenge and something you could look up. But I wanted to derive that myself and figure like reason through the process and and, and figure it out with the help of my buddy ChatGPT. Uh, it was it was really fun. Right. Um, and figuring out sort of like, uh, I mean, one, one thing I actually learned from that, from, from my development experiences is um, while ChatGPT is um, good at making stuff um, that performs correctly, right? The actual act of making it like something that like feels, feels exactly right and exactly the right amount of snappy um, to a human who's touching a screen is actually 
like it's like a very maybe maybe mathematical for developers to actually know this, but I, I don't. For me, it was a very hit and hit or miss project or process. Like I would do something like I drag a card, and you know, like it's supposed to go back to the fan, right? And you can control the speed of that. And for me, it's like I I initially implemented it so um, uh, it had a constant speed always wherever it was going. But you realize that if you drag the card like all the way out to the edge, um, it, it starts coming back really slowly. Or it's not really <laughs> slow; it's just a constant speed. So it's just like if you drag it all the way across, it's just going to take forever to come back, right? Um, so it's realizing like oh, like you 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 probably want to um, make it so that it, the speed is scaled to the distance it's traveling and um, you want to do stuff like uh, ensure that like there's like some subtle deceleration and acceleration so it doesn't just just feel like ridiculously snappy um, uh, were interesting like both UX and technical challenges that like I enjoyed figuring out on my own and um, that was fun I, I enjoyed it Super exciting. So I, I know we were getting close to time here. So I wanted to sure, ask, yeah. what, how can someone become a deep learning expert? Because I think the, the notion of a deep learning expert has many different levels. That's what I've learned mm -hmm. since I've come to NVIDIA. Uh, what's your yeah. advice for, for folks out there? Well, one of the things I like to point out is there's so many different verticals and people like have mm -hmm. no idea that these verticals exist in some cases. Um, uh, for context, like I, I, I've, I've mentored quite a few people, not quite a few, like a couple people at this point in my career, um, especially like, you know, early college students, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things I hear coming out of those conversations is, oh, I want to work in deep learning. My question to them is, where in deep learning do you want to work? Um, mm. And one of the things that I, I, I sort of like, quote unquote, I wouldn't say demand, but I like encourage them to think about is having a very specific focus, even if that focus is wrong and it changes is better than not having a focus at all, because it allows you to become like, a, like becoming an expert requires you to have the humility to take something. It's a weird form of humility and confidence. It's a mix of the two. It's the humility and confidence, like accept that, I'm going to go this direction. I'm not going to be an expert for a long time. And I may not ever be an expert, but I'm going to study it. I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to grow. And if I realize that this is not the thing I want to work on, I can leverage the information gain from this to figure out what I do want to work on. Because in the process of experiencing deep learning, deep learning is so interconnected that um, the you know, like you may stumble onto the fact that you really love working on deep learning kernels and performance. Um, uh, because you're like, oh, like I read the flash attention, pa uh, flash attention paper and it just clicks. Um, and you may not be a person that just really enjoys building like large scale model, model architecture, right? Because the most accurate architecture and, and the most, um, and the most uh, performant architecture may, be not necessarily, may not necessarily be the same. Um, uh, performant being uh, throughput and latency, uh, not, the, mm -hmm. uh, not talking about accuracy. Um, yes. And the interesting part about about that is like there are just so many different verticals with respect to different disciplines in deep learning like it's like you could be a person that really focuses on the data mix of deep learning which is becoming increasingly important by the way um mm -hmm. you could be someone that focuses on model architecture model performance you could be someone that focuses on um a prompting and understanding like at a fundamental level how the language latents of this space work um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's generally, um, what my recommendation, right? You, you, you want to start going deep and start, start in a direction with momentum. And mm -hmm. if, uh, you encounter something that you don't like, or you're, or you're, you're not sure you like something, but you, maybe, you, maybe you encounter something you do, you like more, you can, you can course correct, right? Um, some of the, some of the coolest authors that I see in the realm of deep learning research started on you know, stuff that they're not working on now, right? Some, someone started on Rexis and then they, you know, uh, moved and they worked on CV and then like they took something from CV and applied it to LLMs. And, and that was a big, that was a big improvement uh, or vice versa, right? Someone who was working on, on, on BERT or other transformer architecture was like, Hey, maybe I can apply this. And that's how we end up with vision transformers. Mm -hmm. um, 
So like being unafraid to just like go in a direction without like saying like, I'm fully committing to this is actually something that I, I think is something that really helped me in my career and, and, and how I developed because I, I, to be very clear, I've actually been through a lot of different domains. I've been through, I, I did recommender systems, time series modeling, um, and then stuff like uh, GNNs. And then, and now I'm working on inference across a bunch of different model types, which is predominantly LLMs. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's just like, I wouldn't have discovered any of this if I hadn't been saying like, Hey, Rexus seems interesting for a little while. And I worked on Rexus and I still think it's a really interesting problem. It's just like, I found stuff that I was like more and more interested in over time. And I had opportunities to work on over time. Um, and mm -hmm. being flexible in that sense is something that's super, super valuable. No, it's beautiful advice. I, I smile when you said, uh, pick a direction and go with momentum. Cause I'm like, Oh, he's, he's such a data scientist. He's, you know, doing some type of gradient descent right now to, <laughs> to give life advice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, <laughs> you, you will make many changes over the course of your career and the course of your life with respect to how you learn and what you learn. Mm -hmm. Be um, brave enough to just explore that. Yes. So I have a, as we conclude, I have a, a rapid round of, of three questions. I, there's definitely going to be like a, a part, a part two to this in, in my mind, but so you're stuck on an Island with a specialized chef. And that chef could cook any two meals that you like uh, forever. Mm. You're going to be on this island for a while. What would you want that chef to cook? Two meals. Um, probably something with fiber, good amount of fiber. Um, some sort of salad. Um, probably with some, with some sweetness, like, like a good mix. Like um, mm -hmm. um, um, some form of salad with... Um, goat cheese and strawberries so you get like the tart you get the you get the the sweet you get the the bitter uh, and you get the healthiness and um i personally love fish um so some form of um okay some form of cooked fish um i've had you know uh, food is actually like one of my other loves um, i'm not a great cook self-admittedly but I, I do like to experience food and try interesting things um and there are definitely dishes I think about, like, you know, I, you know, I think about this restaurant in, in Paris when I was traveling earlier this year and it's like, oh, I would, I would eat that fish every day. And I think it's, I think it'd be moderately healthy enough, right? Fish is a, you know, other than the bioaccumulation issue, it's, it's pretty healthy. Yep. Makes sense. Makes sense. Everybody, it seems like a lot of folks are into the salads. I asked this question to a bunch of people and like, salads keep coming I think up. I people are very not, about I'm wanting to live healthy on this island that they're stuck on. So nah. maybe that, that was like, my thought. I, I'm just pure in pure glutton mode <laughs> at that point. Um, besides, I guess, besides solving hard problems and you just shared food, what's one thing that brings you joy? Um, my dogs. Ooh, I love my dogs. Dogs. Oh, plural. Yeah, oh, dogs. Yeah, must be grew, up, grew up with grew up with four dogs. Um, family still has them. Still go back and see them all the time. That's beautiful. Yeah, pets. Yeah, pets are quite. Yeah. I have a guinea pig, and he's he's quite a riot. Um, and what's so? My last question is is not necessarily about being famous, but it's more. Think of it, I guess, as an alignment problem, an end end goal alignment problem. What do you want people to remember about you? That's a good question. Um, I think the two things that I want people to take away from how I talk and how I interact with people is that I am passionate and kind. I think those mm. are two traits that I consider myself that are important to me in terms of like maintaining who I am. And if I, I feel like if I ever lost one of those two things, like it would, I would cease to be me. Maybe, maybe that's, that's a bit, uh, apocalyptic mm -hmm. but you know like those are two things that i think are important about myself and uh i hope that yes. others take away from my, their interactions with me that i'm those two things because i'm certain i certainly know i'm passionate and I, I certainly hope i am kind um yeah i i would second that i i could feel that when i interact with you so um you know i think you're doing a, a pretty good job so far to be honest <laughs> thank you <clears throat> Well, I, I, you know, I wanted to thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge and also sharing some of those mental alignment patterns that you use to, that you've navigated your career with and 
you know, yeah. um, we'll definitely have you back on the show. Absolutely. I had a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mark, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you. All right. Take it easy. See ya. Cheers.